My name is Jeff said is Craig Butterman and I direct the Civil Rights and Police Accountability Clinic here at UFC. Um, what we do is we represent people who've been abused by the police um, and have absolutely no access to otherwise have access to counsel. We do litigation work, policy work, community based work. We strive, I say, to be a community, I'd say like a, we strive to be a grassroots roundup um, community based law school clinic. And that means that our work by design is always changing, it's fluid. It's not the same thing any single day because it's responsive and intentionally responsive to community direction, need, and strategy. But our mission has been consistent from Jump Street. Um, and that's to improve police accountability, service in Chicago, challenge racism in policing um, in our criminal system and while teaching y'all, teaching our students all that it means to be a lawyer. One of the special things about our clinic, particularly right now at this moment, is that we have the opportunity to support what may be the largest civil rights movement for racial and social justice ever um, in U.S. history. So y'all have a part, have the opportunity really to be a part of not just being history, but making history. Um, I'm coming literally right, right now. I just walked up and, and bless Zoom, but really bless Zoom. I never thought I'd say that, bless Zoom. A uh, half hour ago, we just got done with an argument before the Illinois Supreme Court, um, and, 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 and here we are. Um, it was in a Freedom of Information, Freedom of Information Act case. Um, Chicago police detective, um, who's since been convicted actually of sexual assault, forced our client, Charles Green, to confess to a crime he didn't do. If we win before the Illinois Supreme Court, Mr. Green will then have access for himself um, but also to be able to make entirely public every single investigation into Chicago police misconduct from 1960s to the present available to everybody, including the history of the detective who forced him and tortured him to confess, evidence that can help him clear his name. This is the kind of work that we do and, and hopefully the kind of work that fundamentally changes what transparency can look like. A few years ago, um, I got a call, I got a confidential call, someone, actually someone who, within law enforcement, um, tells me about a video of a police shooting being covered up. White police officer has shot, fired 16 shots, 16 shots into the body of a 17-year-old boy, along with Laquan McDonald. He fired almost all of those 16 shots while the boy lay on the ground helpless. And our work in the clinic not only exposed sadistic murder of a 17 year old kid, um, but also the routine way that the Chicago Police Department has covered up this murder, but not as an aberration, but as a part of standard operating procedure. Creative organizing by really led by black youth on the ground, um, created conditions that actually brought the US Department of Justice here in Chicago to launch a systemic civil rights violation, um, systemic civil rights in investigation into um, Chicago police. And our advocacy led to a federal consent decree that now governs the Chicago Police Department designed to try to remedy the many years long pattern and practice of civil rights violations here, especially against black folks. Um, the most historic part of this decree, and, and there's not a decree in the country that looks anything like it, is the power that we want with our community-based clients. And so we represent community orgs that include like Black Lives Matter Chicago, NAACP, Latinx neighborhood orgs, organ, organizations, some orgs committed in fighting gender-based violence. Um, these orgs, community, um, first time in the nation, we want the power not just to monitor the decree, but actually to directly enforce this decree in federal court. It's the first time that's ever happened in the country. And the decree remains, so as I talk about kind of the fluid nature of what we do, it's, it remains the centerpiece of a lot of the work that we do right now. So for example, like right now, we're litigating um, an enforcement action to stop the Chicago police practice of raiding the homes of black and brown families, pointing guns at little children, the same kind of practice that led to the killing, the murder of Brianna Taylor in Louisville. We just secured, um, within the last couple of weeks, we secured a court order that clearly put CBD home raids under the jurisdiction of the consent decree. And we're now working with people who are most impacted on the remedy to end CBD's violent and racist practice of 
great case solvers. So a little history, 22 years ago, that's when we started this clinic. Um, and then, as today, um, Buster Kanyas remembers, police department was been engaged in a decades long practice of holding people incommunicado, bowels of, very, of these police stations where people have been abused and even tortured. Um, when we started this clinic, among the things that we did was just talking with people everywhere, anywhere and everywhere about how law students working with professors could both best meaningfully contribute um, to address systemic police abuse in Chicago. And the very top of the list, um, and, and maybe not surprising when you're talking about what can lawyers do, what can law students do, um, was access to counsel, making the promise of Miranda real in Chicago. And, and y'all know, we all know the iconic Miranda warnings, right? You have the right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used against you. You have the right to an attorney. And, and what comes next? Well, shout out. What comes after that? Kind of on one of the point of view. Right. Free of charge, too, right? Y'all know it. But even though really everybody in this room can recite that, right? You can recite that from memory. You've seen it on TV shows since you've been little kids and shit. I saw it on TV shows since I was a little kid because Miranda was decided the day, not the day I was born, but the year I was born. Um, but even though we all can recite these words by heart, people who can't afford an attorney, people without means, those words have been a lie. That last, the last thing that I just asked you to tell. Because the time when folks most need the assistance of a lawyer, when folks are being interrogated by the police, inside those interrogation rooms, bowels of the police station. No lawyer's coming. No lawyer is coming. And we've been fighting this fight for 22 years. Um, one of our first clients in the clinic, or one of the first clients when I came to the clinic, together with Professor Conyers, um, Randolph Stone has since retired, young man by the name of Corinthian Bell, 24-year-old homeless man, living with mental illness. I think Tess revealed he had the IQ of like less than, like a great school, a great school. Um, Someone who we love too, someone who we deeply love, fundamentally gentle, kind human being, fixture on this campus, also beloved by many, many students. So one night, just after I started, just after I started working here, Karethan returned to his mom's home. He's worried about her. He's been knocking on her on her on her door for like three days straight. She hasn't answered. He pushes the door open, he finds her murder. Gruesome, traumatic scene to Karethan. I mean, I none of us can even begin to imagine what he may have felt. He runs out of the apartment, calls the police from a store. After he meets the police back at mom's home, they put him in the back of a car, drive him to area two, um, a police station that become infamous for the torture of black folks. And Corathian spent the next 50 hours locked in communicado in one of those tiny windowless interrogation rooms. Chicago police detectives preyed on those invulnerability, on his vulnerabilities, they beat him. They made him think he was gonna die. And at the end of those 50 hours, I think you, you, you probably know what happened. They forced him to give a videotape confession to the murder of his own mom. While Corathian then sat frightened in a Cook County jail cell for about the next 18 months, 17, 18 months, his mom's real killer, whose DNA was all over the place because mom did fight for her life. Um, evidence that the police had available but refused to, to test from day one. That man actually went on to rape and assault um, at least four other women within blocks of Corathian's mom's home. Imagine if he had a lawyer. Imagine if he had access to a lawyer when the police first brought him to that police station in that interrogation room before those 50 hours of interrogation. So just this week, and I'm sorry just for the buildup, but I mean, it's exciting because I'm give, want to give you a sense of what we do in this clinic and what y'all would be doing. Just this week, 56 years after Miranda was decided, although we got a Supreme Court that might decide to end Miranda, but that's another story, another lecture. I won't be able to go there. 22 years after we founded this clinic, 20 years after we first worked to free Corathian Bell, um, the heroic work done by Professor Connors, her students, we're finally about to make Miranda real in Chicago. My students and I, this week, we're finalizing a consent decree, a second consent decree, this one in state court. Um, that's going to require the Chicago Police Department to, one, make lawyers available to, from the public defender's office um, to vulnerable people locked in these inside CBD stations 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They got to put phones in every single interrogation room. You want to talk about incommunicado attention, there's not going to be a phone in every interrogation room um, with the sign to the 24-hour hotline to the public defender's office in each of those rooms in every station. 
private room in every police station for private confidential um, meetings between people who are locked up and their attorneys. Um, and those giving people access, a requirement to give people access, prompt access to those phones and in no, no case, any time more than three hours. And they got to provide us with data in literally every single, for every single arrest for at least the next two years so that we can monitor this and also enforce as necessary. Eric Zimmerman, um, third year, some of y'all might know, some, some, some don't because mostly first years. Um, he, uh, he started working in my clinic, in, in the clinic, um, summer 2020. And one of the first things that he did was actually work to bring this lawsuit that I'm just, ta that I'm just talking about. Um, and this was in the midst of summer 2020, in the midst of mass arrest going on here, brutality and communicative detention. Um, as people were, particularly young Black folks, were lifting voices with allies um, in protest against police violence. As he prepares to graduate, um, is about to walk, um, he'll know throughout his legal career that he is a, was a part and a significant part of making the promise of Miranda real in Chicago. So check out our website. Um, you'll get a deep sense of, of, of what it is that we do. Um, students, you all, I'm not going to repeat what folks said. You, you do everything from the guts to the glory. This isn't something where I'm the one who's doing the stuff and doing the arguments. It's like, you're doing the trials, you're doing the investigations, you're making the oral arguments, you're doing the stuff from on the ground day one, working with working alongside shoulder to shoulder with people who've been fighting this and supporting folks. And as everybody said, enroll in a clinic, enroll in a clinic this fall, enroll in our clinic, but enroll in a clinic. <laughs> this is where you get to learn where all that it means to be a lawyer, um, a real practicing lawyer, learning by doing, representing real people in need, in need of assistance. And um, as you probably can tell, even as I'm coming without much sleep and from this oral argument, it's really fun. <laughs> it's fun to actually do work that has the potential to positively impact another human being's life. Fight alongside your clients for justice, against injustice, for freedom. Join us. Just so everyone knows, the phones that will be installed. Oh, please. Police stations will forever be known as Futterman phones. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is what my wife says. Let me just let me just say this is what my wife says with the Futterman phones. She's gonna be saying when you start seeing everybody with like these like phone imprints on their heads, <laughs> like the Futterman phones. Remember, the Spider-Man who got those phones. <laughs>